Welcome to the Executive Lounge. This is the business leadership program that brings you the nuggets and the insights of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of starting, nurturing, and growing their own businesses in different sectors of our economy. Today we're joined by a woman who was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at the age of one. Now, cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder that affects muscle coordination and movement, but it does not interfere with the ability to learn. And you're gonna find exactly how my guest today has lived that latter part of the description. She's full of life, witty, intelligent, and she has founded her own business that uh, serves more than 200 small or microfinance businesses in Ghana. We'll learn more about that. You're welcome to the Executive Lounge, Farida Bedwe. Thank you for having me. Great. Now, growing up as a child and being diagnosed with uh, cerebral palsy, not being able to do the things that you, your friends and peers would do, how was that like? I always say you cannot miss what you don't know. So this, this has been my life. I mean, I don't know any other life, so I cannot c compare it to, to your life, for instance. The, the fact that growing up, you could run, you could run around and do all those things. Mm -hmm. I have never been able to do that. So I have left my life within the confines of, of my limitations, physical limitations, that is. Of course, that doesn't mean that I didn't try to to break those, those boundaries, but then some of them just could not be broken. So, yeah. What was it like in terms of your family? Because I know that quite at an early age, your mom would go to Makala with you. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was my mom actually homeschooled me until I was twelve. Mm. Um, we um. We were living in the Caribbean for, for, for a greater part of my early childhood. And there are also developing countries, or rather developing islands like, mm -hmm. like us. So they did not have the facilities that, that the developed world had. So she subscribed to a correspondence course in the UK. And she was using that to teach me until we came to Ghana. And when we came to Ghana, in 1988, she had to she had to start working due to circumstances. So she didn't have the time to spend as much time teaching me like like she did when I was growing up. Hmm. So I went to mainstream school for the first time when I was 12. Wow. I went straight straight to JSS one. No, 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 it's called junior high school. <laughs> that was junior secondary uh, school then. <laughs> but some of us can never get, get rid of the junior secondary school thing. That's yeah. right. So you went into JSS 1 yeah. and um, at age 12, you're yeah. very aware of your surroundings and the people around yeah. you. Did you feel that you were treated differently? Um, I, no, not really, because I was put in a school where I was blessed to have very supportive, very helpful friends. I always say that, that I mean, children are, are more accepting of things that are different than adults are. Because I don't know whether it was the fact that they were told to be my friends or what initially, but I remember going into the classroom and <laughs> You know, those days, I don't know whether it's still the case, but you, there are two, two students to one that so you have mm -hmm. to sit next to next somebody. To somebody. You, have to, you have to share, share the desk. And it's like, okay, this is probably that she cannot walk properly, so you have to help her. And, and, th and that was it. And I made such helpful, great friends there who, who would actually wait with me when my mom is late to pick me up from school, they, they, they will sit with me and wait until she, she can't for me before they go home. Yeah. And this was in Collegona. Wow. Yeah, Cambridge, Cambridge JSS in Collegona. That's uh, on the, yeah. the, 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 the yeah. what do you call it, the coast? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and our school was in an uncompleted building, so I mean, it, it was very sad too. I say it, it doesn't get more sad too than that, mm -hmm. but yeah. No, it, 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 it was actually a very interesting experience. And I wouldn't give it up for, for, for anything because apart from everything else, it made me realize how privileged I was because in that, in that sense, certain, most of my classmates were really unprivileged. I mean, they, they were being beaten because they could not afford to pay extra classes fees, which was less to nothing for me. So then I realized that it's true. All, all, all the fingers on the hands are not even. And it really exposed me to the fact that I was, I was better off than most people were. And this was back in the early 90s. Ghana, Ghana wasn't anywhere near what it is now, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of development and all that. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Now, your family, yeah. um, give us a sense of uh, the family portrait. Who's, who would be in it? Well, um, growing up, because we were not here, we had a really close-knit nuclear family system. It was just me, my mom, my dad, and my sister. It was just the four of us. It was when we came to Ghana that I started realizing that, oh, I have, a, I have grandparents, I have I have uncles, I have cousins, and the whole extended family thing became more, more real to me. I mean, over there, it, it was only my auntie and my cousins in the UK who, who, who I knew. And beyond that, I didn't really know any other family. That, uh. As a child, you went through school, blessed with some helpful friends. Uh, did, has that started any lifelong relationships that you still hold? Um, we, we kind of grew apart. I mean, after, after, after Cambridge, I, I, I was only in Cambridge for one year, mm -hmm. actually, because the, the government could, was not paying the landlord, so they sacked us from the school, so we all had to go to different schools. So then, so I went to Canada with the Mwan GSS for for form two and form three, and I was the BC there. Then after that, once again, the disability and friendly terrain of our schools in Ghana prevented me from going to senior high school or senior secondary school. Then, so it was decided that. I should go and do a diploma in IT. And so I went to St. Michael Information Technology Center and I did a diploma in, um, in the management of information systems. Everybody in, in that class had either finished secondary school or university because it was actually a professional exam. And I, was obviously the youngest in the class. And probably the brightest. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> 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 so, it, uh, it, so I'm sure my classmates were looking were look, were look at me and wondered, what, what am I doing with them? But then, as it is, the most important thing is you prove yourself. And that, that changes the people's perception about you. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of my friends and my, uh, and, and my business partner, he tells me that most of the time he forgets that I have a disability because he sees me just, just like anybody else. Then, then when we go out and we are in public and people are, are staring at me, then he wonders that what are they looking at? That before it clicks that I, I, I look, that I walk differently or, or my manner of things are different. Yeah. Wow. So, you went through your uh, MIS course yeah. and you had employment. How was it getting a job? How was how what, was it a hurdle or was it easy to to be accepted? I was uh, I was blessed. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I got very very interesting employers who who were willing to take the chance with me. My first job was actually uh, at the Marie Computer. Yeah, um, they, they are no longer in existence. That's right. Yeah. I was 
it belonged to my first father. So after I finished um, my diploma, I was doing my, my hard diploma at the time when I said, that, OK, I want to get to work experience. Mm -hmm. And so I, I approached him, him and I told him that I, I want a job. He said, OK. So I started working there. I was working in the, in the administration department. So I got, it, 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 it was actually an eye opener for me. I had to learn how to deal with clients and all the things. So then after that, I worked there for a year. Then I finished doing my, my hard diploma. Mm -hmm. Then by then I had gone through the various stages of IT, learned about the various um, sections, and I had done networking hardware, all those things. And I had decided where, which, which area I wanted to focus on, software. So I started looking around for the software company. Back then, there were, there were, there were two prominent ones, Pestor and Soft. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go to Soft. That was during the first Doomsaw crisis mm. in the late 90s. Yes, right. So when, when I got there, the, the receptionist told me that um, the, because of, of the Doomsaw crisis, Everybody was going to come to, to work in the evening when there was light. So the, the running shift had to come back in the evening. And I was like, OK. So I went home. And I, I got back in the evening. Uh, when I got there, everybody was there. So I, I approached the, um, the head of the technical department, Herman Jenny Hersey. And I told him, that, oh, I don't have, have any work experience, but I want a chance. So, so if you, you give me the chance, I, I promise you that you never regret it. He said, that, he said that, okay, come on board. So he, he took me to the, to, the, to the technical department. It, 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 it was in a 20 or 40 foot container. Mm -hmm. He opened the door, full of boys. I was like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself <laughs> into? I was 18 at the time. I mean, I have never been exposed to so many boys at the time, mm -hmm. but then I, I tell myself that, look, this is what, what you want to do. You have to find a way to work with the boys. So that's how I started my career in software development. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And in the late 90s, you would have worked with people like Rubel. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rubel. A very boisterous environment. Exactly. How did you cope? I became one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you adapted pretty much Exactly, quickly. exactly. That was the only way to... to to deal with them. Because if not, I would have died from, from teasing. Because, <laughs> they, because I was teased. Ah. Wow. In, in, in the end, I became even worse, worse than, than <laughs> the man who came to teasing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So in all of these, you know, you said something very profound, that this is the life you've known. Um, but there's a certain proactiveness about you. Um, you talked about how you went to, you approach your friend's father. You went to soft yourself. How did you, was there something in your upbringing that you could point to that gave you that as a strength? Well, I, I think it, it was my mom who, um, who basically just, did, just always said that, 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 life, that life is like a deck of cards. You, you have to make the best out of the hand you are dealt. And she, she did not know anything about raising a child with a disability or anything. But then when she had me, she, had, she, she quickly learned how to do it. And she did a, a marvelous job. And um, people always ask me, was, was she a trained teacher? And I say, no, she just learned, on the, learned as we went along. And that is it. You have, to, you, you have to find a way of dealing with your circumstances. You have to find a way of making the best out of your life. And I always thought to myself, what, 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 at the end of the day, what do I have to lose? I mean, if, 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 if I approach them and they say no, I, at least I tried. No never killed anybody. True. We are, we are too afraid of rejection that, that we don't take certain chances in life. 
But, but if you have the perception that at least you tried, I mean, you, 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 were, you, you go back with a sense of fulfillment that you did not miss out on, on, on an opportunity or anything. So in the end, the opportunities you really miss are the ones that you never took. Yes. Absolutely. We're going to take a break and when we come back we'll find out more about Farida's life and work. Uh, more importantly, how she went down the road of co-founding her own business and starting or creating a platform, a cloud-based platform that over 200 microfinance companies are utilizing today. This is the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. With me today is Farida Bedoue. She's a co-founder of uh, Logicel, a software company that's providing financial technology uh, platform for microfinance companies in Ghana. Now, Farida, how did you come to the point where you've developed this cloud-based platform for microfinance companies? I, it, it came out of um, boredom, actually. I was working in, in the mobile VAS services industry for a while. I worked with Rankard Solutions for about nine years. Then after a while, I said, I'm, I'm a bit bored, so let me move to the fintech industry. And when I moved there, I realized that there's no software that adequately fits the needs of the microfinance industry. Um, the ones that were available back then were brought in from India and um, Kenya and other places mm -hmm. like that. And they did not necessarily fit our peculiar needs in Ghana, so to speak. And I looked at the processes and I said, let me just try my hand and see whether I, I can do something with it. So that's how Logitech started. Um, I co-founded it with David Dinti. I had the, the business, I, I had the, um, the technical know-how. He knew about the industry, so it was a good mix. And we started with one, with, we started then, um, we got a partnership with the Association of Microfinance Companies in Ghana to be the preferred software their members. Mm -hmm. So within a year, we, are, we were able to sign on about 50 microfinance companies while we were building it. Of course, a, a good software, you never finish building it. it it's always evolving. Mm -hmm. But for the first three years, we were taking input from our clients to build it. So while they were using it, they were coming up with various um, new features or various issues that they wanted fixed or resolved and all those things. And I think it made them feel as if they were part of the whole process. So some of them are actually very passionate about it, even more passionate than I am <laughs> yeah, about the whole system. Um, so yeah, that is how it started the logic show. Yeah. How long ago? It started in 2012, 2012, 2012. And currently, you're serving more than 200 yeah. uh, microfinance companies. Yeah. What's the biggest hurdle in interfacing technology and financial services in Ghana? Um, I would say it, 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 it's mainly the fact that there are no strict rules. So everybody has their own way of doing things. So we had to to lay, to lay it down, we, we had to come up with a standard based on based on what on what majority were doing, and some of them who had their own other ways of doing things. We told them them that look, we cannot add this to our system because if if there was a strict guideline, it would have been easier for us because then we can. We, we, can, we can model our system according to those guidelines. Mm. 
but but back then the industry wasn't really be regulated. The the central bank came came in with their reports, so we built their report into the system for them. So I think that brought up a bit of um, regulation into into the, the whole thing because you you knew that these these were the requirement from the central bank, so that easier to build the system based on those requirements and all that. Yeah. So yeah, that, that has been one of the major hurdles that we have gone through. Another, another hurdle is getting competent, good, loyal staff. Competent, good, loyal staff. Yes. <laughs> it's a challenge finding them. Yeah, it is a challenge finding them, especially in this part of the world where developers are a real hot commodity. So as soon as they, they, they get a, a, a better offer, they just leave. And everybody is, is looking for them. So I mean, that, that has been a major challenge for most of the software houses in this country. Mm. Because obviously, we will not be able to pay them what, what they are paying them in the States or whatever. Some of them have even left and gone to the States because they got a better offer there. Mm. So. But in, in your, let me just digress a little bit, in your own personal experience yeah. over the time that you spent at Rankard and at Soft, yeah. um, and, and in this period the, 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 the software space was evolving, yeah. so there were new offers and new opportunities elsewhere, mm -hmm. but you stuck to these businesses. What about you um, made you stay? Well, for me it was loyalty as well as interest. But I think it, 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 was likely, it was likely loyalty because I was like, these people gave, gave me a chance, so I should I have to work for them for a while. I, I, stayed, I stayed at soft for three years, then for, for a total of nine years. Then what, what made me leave was lack of interest in what I was doing anymore because I always say developers, although some of them are motivated by money, most of them are motivated by interest in what they are doing. So if what they are doing that thing catch their interest, they get bored and leave. Mm. Yeah. So, so in, in terms of the people that you've been able to retain and, yeah. and, and select, what, what do you look for beyond just the ability to code or I look or for for their interest I, I, at their interest level in what we are doing. I look at their passion for what we are doing because although we are not um, we are not an, a, a non profit organization, we, we, I always say we are we, we build a solution that solve problems for 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 the co for the good of the community. Mm -hmm. And we have also subsidized the software heavily for the, for the microfinance industry so that a lot of them can afford to turn onto our platform. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if we are to charge realistically, most of them couldn't afford to do it. So whatever we are doing, we are also doing it from, from that aspect of, of it as well, that, that we are looking at the good of, of, of the nation, the good of the community. Now, how's that coming along? Are you finding that, um, I mean, if you're supporting 200 plus businesses yeah. at heavily subsidized rate, your cost uh, yeah. in terms of yeah. being able to compete? Yeah, things, things are a bit difficult. I mean, last year was, was a very difficult year for businesses. I always say any business that didn't collapse last year deserves a pat on the back. I mean, it was a really difficult year. But as we say in Ghana, we are managing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are all very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but we are hoping that, that with a new government, uh, I mean, things, things will turn around a bit more for them. How did you manage last year? I know things were quite erratic, and how often did you have to revise your plan and strategy for the year? What three key <gasps> things do you think you needed to do? Um, we, we, we just had to. We had to make um, some some hard decisions. We had to change things to survive. I mean, m most of the time in businesses, you have a five-year plan mm -hmm. of or a ten-year plan that you, that that you are going according to. 
But then when you have to survive, you have to survive. And, and during, during that period, you have to put those plans aside and do what needs to be done to, to keep the business going. And that is what, what we did. And that is what all businesses had to do last year. Because the way the dollar went up, the way the, the price of fuel went up, and all those things. And we had doomed so as well. I mean, so for the past two years, we have been living hand to mouth, literally. Yeah. Last year was challenging, granted. You stuck through it. You had to adapt. But there's a certain element in all the businesses that prevailed at the end of the year which had to do with the manpower, with the people, the culture that kept them together. Yeah. How did you manage yours? What, what kind of culture do you have that made it possible for the people to stick by the vision? Well, I let this, uh, we try as much as possible to let the staff feel as if they, they are part of the whole decision making process. To the extent that, I mean, even when we are making decisions that, that on a number of circumstances, top level management should be making, we, we try and involve them in it. So they feel as if they are part of the company. And I think that that is what has helped us a lot within some staff because we, we, we have about three, two or three people who have been with us since we started the company and they are still with us. Yeah. Now, you talked about finding good, competent, loyal people. Mm -hmm. okay, so let's talk about competence. The industry is growing. Um, and what do you look for in terms of the competence? Do we have the capacity as a nation to provide the level of competence in terms of the, the, what we're churning out of our education system mm -hmm. to deliver for now and the future? That is the big problem I have because I mean there are certain what what is churned churned out, out of our educational system that is largely very theoretical. So when you put them in front of so when so when you put them in the work environment and you give them a business problem to solve and, and the parameters change a little, they are a bit lost. So you have to spend about three to four months or even fitness, training them, getting them to do the point where they can be productive. Mm. By the time you go through that, maybe six months later, somebody plucks them out of your hand. Okay. I, I'm like, okay, the educational sector should come to us and, and ask us, what do we need? What, what, what attributes do we want from our employees? What, what should they teach them in the universities? So that we can, we can tell them what we want, because if not, we are going to have a high level of, of, of we are going to continue having this high level of, of, of unemployment, and we are going to have jobs available that they cannot fill. Because that, that is a problem that some of us are having these days. So it's quite possible that in the software space, we actually don't have unemployment. The jobs are available, yeah. but we don't have the manpower to fill yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. So are you ever at a point where you're considering outsourcing work? That is one thing that I don't want to do. Um, but has that ever become almost the best option to take under certain I've circumstances? Been, I've, been, I've been resisting it for a long time because I, I don't want it to be that somebody will come and say that we are where we are because we had foreign, foreign talent. I believe that, that in Ghana, we, we, we have the talent to be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and as well as, um, as compete on, on the international market. <laughs> but as soon as, because it's, it's like when, when we, we talk to potential investors and we tell them, them that we develop the system Locally, they, they don't believe it because it's like, I mean, how could you guys have developed this big system locally and that does all these things? But yeah, so as, so as soon as you bring in foreign talent, it just takes the whole 
turn, turn out of your hands mm. and uh, then, then they attribute it to that person and all that. But I mean, the bottom line is the business has to survive. Okay. So if that is a decision we have to make to make it survive, it will be very painful, but then we have to, to do what, what needs to be done to make the business survive. But I guess for you, if uh, there's a better coordination or alignment between academia and, yeah. and the, the, the business space, yeah. then we could fix yeah. that. Yeah, Ashasi is is one of the best universities when it comes to turning our software and IT personnel. So I I like to recruit for them, but then they, but then because they are one of the best, they are in very high demand. They are very difficult to get them as well. Mm. Yeah. So an alignment of academia and industry holds the key to ensuring that we fix this gap so Farida can keep her business here and employ local talent. We're going to take another break and when we come back we're going to learn about Farida's very given side or, and, and also uh, the future of Logicel as well as the software development space in Ghana. Stay tuned, this is the Executive Lounge, we'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. As you know, we're talking to Farida Bedwe, co-founder of Logicel, a software company that's providing immense support for the microfinance industry in Ghana. Farida, in 10 years, where do you see Logicel? Well, we hope to be able to scale up and move to other African countries, providing our cloud-based banking software known as Ziglar for, for the microfinance companies across Africa. Uh, microfinance is everywhere. And, I mean, it, it is even in, um, in certain parts of, of Europe. Yeah. So the most important thing is to, is to get the various peculiar needs of the various countries and try and build it into the system so that it can easily scale up to meet the needs of other industries within the continent. What must happen in our own ecosystem to see that dream achieved? Well, we need, we need a lot of funding, we need a lot of logistical help to be, because it's very difficult to run a business in, in this part of the world, especially a software business where the intellectual property is, is, is the only asset that, that you have because, I mean, it's the only real asset you have because unlike factories and things where they have the equipment, they, they can go to for, for loans with, with, with that asset as a collateral. In, in, in our industry, it's very difficult to get a loan from, from the bank because you don't have picked assets of high value. Uh, so how do you juxtapose or, or, or you know, put that, uh, the Ghanaian situation and what uh, pertains in Silicon Valley side by side? Yeah. What, 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 how would we have to, to, what would we have to do to get there? Yeah, in Silicon Valley, you have venture capital uh, and investors willing to take the, the risk in your business. To the extent that I mean, they can they, they can invest in you and not expect return for the next five ten years, but but most of the investors in Ghana are short term, and it's very difficult to um, to turn over that money, especially when you are using it to build a product, and you are not using it for anything that is tangible. Uh, in terms of tangible, I mean something that you can see. Mm -hmm and touch, it, it's very difficult to convince them to give you, you that money. So I'm hoping that as the as things involve and people start seeing the relevance of software, they, 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 they will likely be more interested in, in investing in that industry. Mm. And, and we should have, have more venture capital and, and more investors interested in, in investing in in the software industry. Beyond the business and beyond what you do, you are quite passionate about 
offering support to people who have one form of disability or the other. Oh. What have you been doing? Well, I'm part, I'm part of, of an organization called Shake. Shake is an organization of people with autoimmune and neurological conditions and their caregivers. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we do advocacy. We, we have a support group that meets every, every month. So we come together, we talk about our problems. We, we get research people to come and give us as advice in either the medical or the, the diet tree or whatever field they are specialist mm -hmm. in. But we also have a center in Osu where we, where we treat children with cerebral palsy and other um, neurological conditions. We give them free, free physiotherapy. And yeah, so that is what we do. Interesting, we so that's what you do at Sheke. Yeah. We chose Osu because Osu Alata, behind the, um, the castle, mm -hmm. there's a community there where there are so many children with, with, with neurological conditions there. So what we are initially doing was paying for them to go to Kolobu to do the physiotherapy there. But then the transportation cost became an issue. So because of that, the, the parents were not taking the children because they claimed they didn't have money. So you moved the care yeah. to them? Uh-huh, yeah. So we decided to move it to them. Which, so it's literally within like, working distance. So they have no excuse now not to take the children to the therapy. We, we have volunteer therapists who come there three times a week for for six to eight hours to treat about 13 children in a day. And some, some of the children are actually doing well. A, a couple of them have actually started work, working a bit to go to, to school. You know, so such stories make it worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the organization was founded by um, Nana Ya Ajiman. As, as a result of her autoimmune condition. Yeah. Wonderful. So you are survivors who are looking to make life better for other yeah, people. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. So that's what you do, but you, you're generally a charitable person, even though I, I'm told you <laughs> like to hide behind the, the, in the shadows and, and still impact on lives. What else do you do? Well, I do. I mean, that, that is my main charity that I support. Um, I also do a lot of advocacy on social media. Uh. Yes, talking about <laughs> social media. Um, I, and I know this is uh, an interesting thing. You, you recently posted about uh, uh, one of our uh, largest hotels, yeah. uh, five-star hotel that didn't have disability parking. Yeah. How important are some of these things and how much advocacy work have you been doing in that regard? Uh, is it paying off? Well, it, it's very important because what happened was um, my driver had to drop me at the entrance, walk into the hotel with me, take, take the, the car all the way to the, to the park and I'll come back. And, uh, and it's very inconvenient. I remember when um, when I first saw, uh, saw saw the disability parking symbol at the Accra Mall, I was so overjoyed that as long as we reached somewhere in in, in disabled assets mm -hmm. in this country. But then when I wanted to park there, that was like three, four years ago, the security man told me that. I can't park there. I said, why? They said, it's for motorcycles. I said, <laughs> what? I mean, I have been pitched very few times in my life, but that was one of the few times that I was pitched. I couldn't believe that. They have actually put the sign there, but they hadn't educated the security man as to what it meant. So I had to spend five minutes arguing with the security man, asking him whether, whether that symbol looks like, 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 a, motorcycle. like, like a motorcycle or a wheelchair. 
in the end, he just let me pack there so, so that I'll take my trouble and go. <laughs> yeah. no, but, but, but then since then, the things have gotten better. Mm. But we are still not where we need to be as a, as a nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you, you go to some of these places and you realize that that, that they've been, that everybody, everybody people have bribed the security men to allow them to park in, in, in the disabled spots. And it's like, I mean, what, what is this? The, the, the few advantages that we get for being a, a disabled, I mean, let's face it, Ghana is one of the, of the most difficult countries to have a disability. And, and, and if and they are getting you find this, a place where you can park, yeah, someone's going to yeah, steal the parking yeah, spot. Yeah, that's, totally I mean, it, 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 it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Not, not just that the security men take the bribe, but, but that able-bodied people who should know better have the, have the temerity to bribe them. That's food for thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what do you do to relax when you are not busy thinking up some creative way of <laughs> helping microfinance companies work better? I actually read a lot. I, um, I watch my, my action thrillers. Mm. The, the bloodier, the better. Oh, really? Yeah. I What's the last one you saw? I love The Blacklist. Yeah, I love The Blacklist. Too. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you watched The Blacklist with Dungeon? No. It's good. Okay, you well, should. I yeah. will. Yeah. I will. Okay, that's, that's an assignment. Then, yeah, then, then I like hanging out with my friends, you know, checking out the little itchy mm -hmm. in town, mm -hmm. criticizing the food and, <laughs> and the fact that that there's no disabled park in there. Exactly. Uh, complain, complaining loudly to everybody. And, uh, you know, yeah. So that's, that's, that's a whole new level of advocacy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. Like recently, I, I must commend um, these this people, AMPM at Bellagio. Mm -hmm. I went there for breakfast and there was no, no, no lift. But then, um, not knowing that, that there was a lift, but there are. Um, their staff didn't know that they could take me through that lift. So I climbed the stairs. Then I wrote a review on their, on their Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Then they came back and I apologized that, that, that obviously they have to educate their staff better. And that next time I'm coming, I should just let, let them know that they'll make sure somebody take me through the lift. And I found that commendable because usually we, we tend to get on the defensive when somebody criticizes us about anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they were able to take them back mm -hmm. and turn it around. So you like watching your movies, you like going out to eat, and um, you also um, enjoy, you know, the finer things in life. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you had to describe yourself, um, what would be the words that you'd use? I mean, the things that really bring you alive. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Who would have thought? Crazy, mm. yeah. You are quite a witty person. And, um, you know, it's, it's rather unfortunate that able-bodied people or, you know, we tend to feel that, okay, because someone has a disability, they, they may not have the same tendency to be funny and witty. But how did you, how did that evolve? How did you become so witty? You tell me, because you, you are the one who said, who said I'm witty. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know. I just have a, have a crazy sense of humor. I, mean, mm -hmm. I just like, I, 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 I love sarcastic wit, which, which a lot of people don't get in Ghana, so you have to tone it down <laughs> before you, you, you end up offending people. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it just a part of who I am. And like you said, a lot of able people, people don't get that. People with disabilities are just like them. We have the same desires, we have the same, I mean, the same needs, the same wants that, that you guys have. I mean, it's just that, that there's a part of us that doesn't work properly. And I always say that, look, everybody ha has, has a disability, it's just that you don't know what yours is. There are lots of hidden disabilities. Mm. There are things that I can do that you cannot do. Just, just like there are things that you can do that I cannot do. And it's just that, that the world has been, has been passionate in a way that makes your life easier than mine. 
But, but believe me, if you go and you live into in, in a disabled adapted flat, you, you, you find it very difficult to survive because everything has been adapted for, for the wheelchair level. So you have to stoop, stoop to do everything and you, and you realize how inconvenient it, it is for you to do that. That is the same thing that we go through when we live in your world. Wow. Yeah. That's profound. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you. Thank uh, you for you having for me. for joining us. <laughs> and as always, we end with five takeaways from this conversation. Number one, the world as you know it should not limit you from becoming what you intend to be. And life is like a deck of cards. Play the hand you're dealt and play to the best of your ability. Whatever your limitations are should never be the reason why you cannot live a fulfilled life. Look around you for other people who you can help along the way. No matter where you find yourself, you can still be useful to someone else. And above all, have fun. Be crazy. You know, <laughs> be in touch with your witty self. Because inside of us, there's always a nice pressing in there. My name is Inshira Addo, and I urge you to go forward, make rain. We'll be back with more on the Executive Lounge. And a big thank you to the folk at Villa Monticello and for our guest, Farida Bedway. This has been the Executive Lounge. See you later. Shalom. <laughs>